What's up, chapel? I feel like I shouldn't be here. Uh, Pastor Marissa, also known as Catherine Coleman, she's just taking an offering and received an altar call all at the same time. She just took it over. So um, it is good to have people empowered in the house of God. A lot of good stuff going on. We've been in five days of, of prayer this past week, 6 a.m. prayer meetings, but also all night prayer Friday night. And it was just a beautiful time. I think we've seen some overflow of that this morning during our worship set because I believe as you pray, God responds to those prayers. Um, and so a lot of people put a lot of hard work into that, our staff, our team, our worship team, our volunteers, but uh, Chelsea, uh, Pastor Brian, Pastor Jason, some of our worship team just sacrificed all week long with early, early mornings and all night Friday night. So give them a big round of applause real quick. I'm getting a little too old for those all-nighters. Man, I'm, I'm just dying. Um, so a lot of good stuff going on, though. In those announcements, you heard Seek Night is Wednesday night. We are not going to have Seek Night this Wednesday night. Uh, Pastor Dylan's wife, Abby, her mother, passed away and went to be with Jesus last week. And so our entire team is going to go up to support her and just be there for them uh, in kind of that difficult moment in their season. But Wednesday night, youth will still be going with a big phone party with Pastor Tyler Sturban. Lots of good stuff. So it's a great night to bring your teenagers to church at 630. And in two weeks, I start a brand new series called I Want to Believe in God, But... And it's going to hit some of the, the major obstacles for people in their faith, maybe for people that don't know God but are interested in finding more about Jesus, or maybe people that are on the fence of Christianity or people that are lukewarm. We're going to remove some of those obstacles out of the way so they can go all in with Jesus. So if you know anybody that's outside of the church, invite them for this new series coming up. Here, everybody, let's turn to 1 Corinthians 7. Last week we talked about marriages and that your marriage may not be over, it may just be empty. And so it's time to maybe refill your marriage. And so maybe that's you. Maybe it takes more than prayer. We have some amazing relationships uh, with Covenant Counseling, which is a, a counseling uh, company we use, I personally use, in Madison, Alabama. But they're also going to send a counselor one day a week to chapel. So they'll house an office out of chapel. And so if you're interested in any counseling whatsoever, please take advantage of that. We pay for the first four visits. If your marriage is struggling, don't quit. Help Get some help from somebody from the outside to help you process what's going on. So you can just fill out a connect card and let them know, hey, I need counseling, and we'll hook that up for you. And so last week we talked about marriages, and what happens is many times we focus on the marriage, but how you get to the marriage many times determines the marriage. So if you think about it like an airport, you get on your flight to your destination, you don't like your destination. Well, it's not the airplane's fault. It's when you were at the airport, you picked the wrong plane. You picked the wrong flight. And many times in marriage, you end up at a destination in your marriage that you are not happy with. And sometimes it's not the marriage's fault. It's the airport you were at. Maybe you took the wrong baggage with you into the marriage. Or maybe you picked the, the wrong airplane or the wrong spouse to date, and now you're frustrated because you're in the wrong destination. Many times we overlook the dating side of relationships in church world. And in doing so, we just expect people to find the right spouse, to get to the right place, and they have no tools or no resources, no principles to figure out who they're supposed to date, how they're supposed to date, when they should get married, when they should stop the dating relationship so that God can bless that relationship. What's crazy about it is, is that so many of our young people and so many of our people in church world are now single or single again, and they're needing to know that God has a purpose for you in every single season of your life. That the gospel is not just for married people with kids. The gospel is for teenagers. The gospel is for people that are widows. The gospel is for senior adults. The gospel is for people that are divorced and single again. The gospel has a purpose in every person's life. But one of the easiest ways to detriment or crash your God-given purpose is by picking the wrong relationships to invest your life into. It's that simple. You can have an amazing purpose, an amazing calling from God upon your life. And you can, you can set yourself up for failure and never accomplish it because of the relationships you decide to hitch your wagon to. You look at Samson in the Bible in Judges 14 through 16. Samson is a hero of the faith, a man with an amazing anointing of God, plus he had some incredible hair. Like, he's anointed with good hair. He's the total package. Like, God had a purpose for him, but he lost out on his purpose because of the relationships he chose to invest himself into. His first wife, literally, he saw her, he said, he told his mom and dad, I want her. 
Like that was their dating process. They get married, she immediately betrays him and stabs him in the back, and then he tells people, who was plowing with my heifer? Like one, don't ever marry a guy who refers to you as heifer. (laughs) Two, don't marry somebody because you see them out and you think that's God's purpose for you. There's a process to determine if they're the right person for you. So he messes up the first time, so then I guess he thinks he'll just fix it the second time. He sees Delilah, he thinks she'll be better, he sees her, he marries her immediately, and the same thing happens again. It was his dating processes that got him off the course that God had set for his life. We need to give every single person the greatest chance possible to fulfill God's calling and purpose upon their life. In order to get there, whom you choose to date and whom you choose to marry is the greatest indicator of if you're going to be successful in your purpose with God or not. Young people, listen. This this is a sermon for everyone who's single, and if you're in high school, it's even more vitally important now. Listen to these words. This is a word from God to you. If you have your Bibles, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, hold them up. Hold them up. Who got the, there we go, looking better. Next week's going to be even better and better and better. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, starting at verse uh, 25. It says this, now concerning the betrothed or those that are engaged or dating, I have no command from the Lord, but I give my judgment as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. I think that in the view of the present distress, it is good for every person to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be free. Are you free from a wife? It's amazing how he talks about a wife as like prison. Are you free from your prison? Are you free? Man, Paul has some issues. But if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a betrothed woman marries, she has not sinned. Yet those who marry will have a worldly troubles. And I would spare you that. This is what I mean, brothers. The appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had, uh, they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no goods, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. And what he's saying is, your eternal purpose in this moment in time should be greater than your temporal earthly purposes. He says, I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about the worldly things and how to please his wife. And his interests are divided. And the married or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly things and how to please her husband. I say this for your benefit not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. What he's saying is, if you're single, it's not like you're missing out on your purpose. If you're single, it's not like God can't use you. If you're single, you actually have a greater ability to be used by the Lord in this present time. He's saying there's a purpose for you being single. There's a a purpose for you being even divorced. There's a purpose for you being a widow. There's a purpose for you being a teenager. There's a purpose. And he says, in this moment when you're not married is the greatest opportunity you have to serve God and devote yourself to his purposes and his mission. But the world will tell you, man, if if you're single, man, I feel so bad for you. Man, you're not married. You're you're single. Like we do this in church. Oh, when are you getting married? Or or when are you going to start dating? When are you getting engaged? And Paul says, whoa, just push pause because this should be the greatest moment of your spiritual walk. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the blessings of relationships. But above all, Father, we thank you for the relationship with you. And we just pray these next few moments that you soften our hearts to be more devoted to you and your purposes than we are earthly relationships. And that we can steward every single earthly relationship, our marriages, our families, our dating, our engagements, Father. We can devote those things to you for your purpose and for your glory and for your honor. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Now, I haven't dated in 20 plus years. And when I did date, there wasn't much dating. Toya literally stalked me for, what, three, four, five months until I finally said yes. So I've been out of the game for a long time. That was before social media. That was before Tinder. That was before dating services online, eHarmony.com, ChristianFarmer, SingleFarmers.com, whatever your thing. 
Like, it was well before those moments. But what I have seen escalate is in the desire to date, people actually attach themselves to someone they're dating as if they're already married. And in doing so, they, even in high school, I, we, we knew a, a person, they were dating in high school, they got a puppy for Christmas together as a joint gift, and they broke up and they were trying to figure out who got the weekends with the puppy, right? So it's literally like a divorce. And so you start wondering why people now, this younger generation, not only are they not getting married till later in life, but a lot of them are choosing not even to get married. And some of the reason is they saw really bad examples or models in their homes. But the second thing, they've already been married emotionally two, three, four, five times. So you have young adults who have the emotional trauma of the woman at the well. And in the church, we're talking about how great marriage is, what a blessing it is. And they can't comprehend it because they've attached themselves, given their heart, their lives, and their bodies to somebody before they were emotionally mature enough to handle it. And then when they split up, it's not a split up, it's a divorce. And a divorce is a perpetual death that never goes away. It's perpetual. It's lost because when you give yourself to someone, you become one. And when you're no longer one, you pull yourself apart. You actually lose parts of yourself to those you give yourself away to. And so then you're a young adult and you're wondering, well, I don't really know who I am. I feel insecure. I don't feel confident. I don't feel this. It's because you've been married two or three times and given yourself away. Now you're left with what remains. And so if we're going to fix that, we need to fix the dating process so that way our young people aren't going through emotional divorce after emotional divorce after emotional divorce. Because it is devastating the younger generations. And we need to start talking about marriage like it's a blessing and not a curse. We bought into the, I almost said crap. I'll say, um, the, the crap. Now I'm in trouble. I'm going to be in the prison Paul was talking about with toy. The, the junk that TV has taught us that marriage is something you suffer through and endure rather than something that is a blessing from God from heaven. And just because TV shows you an example of really terrible marriages, that is not the platform or the template that God wants for us. So we need to start talking about marriage around young people, what it truly is, the blessing that it is. Not the difficulties, but the blessing that you're rewarded from God. So in order to get there, I believe we have to change the rules of dating and being single. That the rules that we're using aren't working. The rules that we're using to just live our lives and give ourselves to our high school sweetheart and get married, get divorced, get married, get divorced emotionally is not working. The, the, the social media influence of dating is not working. The consumer-based mentality for relationships is not working. We have to change the rules. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna give us five new rules for being single, dating, and love. And some of these come from a great book by Joe Beam called The Love Path, which is an incredible book. But rule number one is this. Don't waste the waiting. Rule number one is don't waste the waiting. When we were doing, uh, overseeing youth ministry in Nashville, there was two little girls, 17, 18 years old, and they were just struggling so much. They were like, well, you know, we're about to graduate and, and we're not dating anybody. We're gonna be single forever. I was like, well, you're a senior in high school, and you're 18. you got the rest of your life to find a husband. They said, no, you don't understand. I, there's nowhere to find one at. I said, you know what the problem is? you got small-town ascitis. She said, what is that? I said, small-town ascitis is where you expect to be married and have two kids by the time you graduate. Right? So I thought she'd get mad. She's like, Pastor, you're right. Like, I should already have the guy. Like, like she realized like that was her whole expectation in life and that there should be no waiting, that you should go from being a teenager to being married and having kids right away. And the reason is people bought into the whole fact that if you're not married, you're not usable by God. If you're not married, you are not happy. If you're not in a relationship, then you're alone. And it is better to be alone with Jesus than in a relationship that's pulling you away from Jesus. Don't waste the waiting. Paul even said here, he said, man, it's a, it's a blessing. He says it's not for everybody, but it's a blessing to be 
single. You can devote more of your time to your God-given purpose, to, to chasing after Jesus, devoting to prayer. And what happens is if, if you're not content, you'll start looking for ways to make you feel content. Paul said this in Philippians 4, called the Tim Tebow verse. Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I've learned that in whatever situation I am to be content. Married or single, rich or poor. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound in any and every circumstance. I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. What he's saying is, I've learned to be content. Paul was previously married. Paul was content when he was probably married. Paul is content as a widow. Paul is content when he has enough. Paul is content when he doesn't have enough. Paul learned that as long as he has Jesus, he has everything he needs. And let me tell you something, sweetheart. If you can't be content by yourself with Jesus, you can't be content with a man in anything else. Because marriage is not going to solve your loneliness. Actually, marriage won't even solve your insecurities. Actually, marriage won't even solve your frustrations. Actually, it won't even solve any of your problems. You know what marriage does? It exposes them. Because you could hide them. It's hard to hide them in the house with somebody who's with you 24-7. It's hard to hide your insecurities. It's hard to hide your discontentment. When somebody's around you 24-7, which I think is one of the blessings of marriage, it's the greatest discipleship tool God ever gave us because there is no faking it in your marriage. And so if you can't be content with Jesus, don't think getting married is going to solve your problem. It may actually make your problems worse. And so if you're, if you're single or you're single again, don't waste the waiting. Focus on becoming the right person more than finding the right person. Just like this airplane, you can jump on the, the flight of relationships, but if you bring a bunch of baggage with you, it's still going to be a horrible flight. And so many people that start dating, they bring all their baggage into a relationship, and they expect the new relationship to solve their baggage problem. Well, while you're single, that's your time in life to focus on unpacking your baggage and becoming who God has called you to be. And so if you become the right person, it gets much easier to get married and find the right person. But if you're so focused on finding the right person, you will begin changing who you are to conform to the person you're trying to get. If you don't take the time while you're single to become the person you're called to be, then you'll begin to change or conform or adapt who you are to whoever you're trying to entertain and appease at the moment. We see this, I mean, I've been in church world for a long time now, and there's something that happens with young women who get married and pregnant or pregnant and married when they're young, 18 through 21, 22. They feel like they give their lives up. They've conformed to the, the purpose or the, the motherhood role or, or to the husband. They feel like they lost out on their teenage years, their young adult years, and somewhere around 30-ish, 30 to 35 to 40. We start seeing these marriages that were good for 10, 15 years start to go apart. And it usually happens with all of a sudden this young mom's kids get old enough they don't need her as much anymore. So now their purpose has changed from taking care of these kids to now they start thinking, man, I really miss out on my young adult years. That's the time I should have been having fun. That's the time. And they start seeing other single people out at the club, out at the bar, getting a little thing on. They start thinking, man, I missed out on dancing at the club. And, and the enemy starts taking those thoughts because they feel like they conformed their identity to their husband. Now they want a new identity that's not a mom, is not a husband, it's a single person. And the reason being, they didn't take the time to become who God had called them to be. You have a great opportunity to discover your purpose and to become your spiritual identity. When you look in the Bible, there's, there's two great, great illustrations of this. Adam, before God gave him Eve, he created Adam. He said, Adam, all this is yours. All of this is yours. I want you to cultivate this garden. I want you to take care of this livestock. I want you to do this. He gave him a territory. He said, I want you to cultivate your career. 
Meaning, before I give you Eve, you need to accomplish a few things in your life. Ladies, you might want to find a man who can cultivate his career. Amen. Well, she's talking to me or not. You, you, you may want to find a man who can cultivate his education. You may want to find a man who can cultivate his spiritual walk. Meaning, you should take care of becoming what God has called you to be before you try to include somebody else in it. Right. right? It's not just for guys. Proverbs 31, we love talking about the Proverbs 31 woman. You know what the Proverbs 31 woman doesn't need? A man. She, had, she was a boss. When you look at the Proverbs 31, she was running a career. She was running politics. She was running her house. Like, she didn't need a man, therefore she was happily married because she didn't need him. She understood the blessing it was to be one with him. She took advantage of the opportunity when she was single to become the Proverbs 31 woman because you can't give yourself to someone if you don't know what you're giving away. So my advice would be, I heard somebody say, run as fast as you can towards Jesus. And if anyone can keep up, introduce yourself. You think that Proverbs 31 woman was stopping from some dude who goes job to job, dropped out of high school, dropped out of college? You think she, no, she was running. And the man who was happy enough to marry her was running just as fast as she was. If you want to embrace the time, run after Jesus, I promise you, running after Jesus will never take you farther away from your purpose. One person said marriage is like a triangle. Somebody's going to post that on social media that I'm doing like the Illuminati thing or something. The triangle, that man, woman, that if you pursue God enough, you will meet in the presence of Jesus. That should be your purpose in dating. As I'm going to pursue Jesus, and whoever I find in the presence of Jesus must be who Jesus wants me to marry. Rule number two is you will never find the right person if you don't know who you are looking for. You will never find the right person if you don't know who you're looking for. Proverbs 18, 22 says, he who finds a wife finds a good thing. The problem is if you don't know who you're looking for, every shiny thing will get your attention. In our consumer-based world, that means everything that glitters gets your attention and everything that glitters is not gold. As a matter of fact, everything that glitters on social media at some point will age and it will no longer look like it looked like when it was gold. It's actually probably fool's gold. It'll turn your neck green after you start dating it. Right? So how, how can you find what you're looking for if you don't know what you're looking for? And what happens, you get desperate and you start taking whatever comes along your path and thinking, well, this must be God's will. As a matter of fact, there is much more to attraction than just physical appearance. Because attraction is the, the drawing or desire to draw close to someone to, to get to know them better. That's what attraction is. It attracts you. A marketing ad attracts you to dig deeper into whatever the product is. Same way with people. When you're attracted to somebody, it attracts you to draw you closer to get to know them deeper to see if you really care about who they are. And what happens many times is I had this old, old pastor, Terry Exley, was on staff with us. There was a girl, she'd been married, divorced, married, divorced a couple times, and old Terry just said, boys, he's an old cowboy, boys, I think her picker's broke. I was like, what'd you say? He said, well, her picker's broke. And he told this lady, he said, you don't need to pick any more boyfriends or husbands. We'll pick them for you. I was like, why? He said, her, he's like, she has shown a track record that she has the inability to pick a good man. Therefore, she needs some help. And so what happens is there's four levels of attraction. Physical, intellectual, emotional, and spiritual. And so many times we just focus on the physical. When the physical is supposed to get you started for the intellectual, the emotional, and the spiritual. So physical is this. We're drawn to somebody whose body and features we find attractive. Like, that's the surface level. And so many people begin a relationship just off that. But intellectual is the mind. We're drawn to people who stimulate our interest in our minds. They provoke us to think in deep conversation. Emotional is we're drawn to people who generate positive emotions within us. They make us feel good about ourselves. And then spiritual, we're drawn to people who inspire us to share our beliefs and our values. And what happens is if you just stay at one level, 
If you're mostly physical attraction, it's just a sexual relationship. And that's what we see in most relationships today is they're just mostly sexual relationships. A mostly intellectual attraction, it's a challenging companionship, meaning you're a friend that you challenge one another. Just mostly emotional attraction is a warm friendship. And mostly spiritual attraction is a contemplative partnership. And so those four levels are the levels that you need to determine what you're looking for in all four levels. Because you can have somebody who's very physically attractive and spiritually decrepit. And so I'd argue, allow God to tell you who to look for. Allow God to tell you who to look for. And I would encourage you, you see this with with Jacob and Rachel, that he literally had an idea in his mind of what God had told him who to look for when he got to this certain city. And literally, she came up, she drew water, just like he said was going to happen. She poured the water out. Just like, I would say, I would encourage you to lay a fleece before the Lord. And then if you're single, you should be praying for your future husband or wife right now. And you should have qualities written down. I'm not talking about just physical qualities. Don't, don't, don't put, uh, I'm looking for Kim Kardashian. Or I'm looking for whoever the ugly guy is that's now, the, all the guys are ugly. Whoever the guy is. I'm talking about qualities. I want a man who can stimulate my mind to want to grow in knowledge of all things. I want a man who can hold me by my hand in church and pray for me. I want a man emotionally who can sit with me and help me grieve when there's loss in life. I want a man who can get to know my heart and know what gets me to. You need to figure out what you really want and begin to pray into that And begin to expect God to lead you in the direction where you'll find that because those desires are probably godly desires if they come through a place of prayer. But thirdly, rule number three is, yeah, you're looking, you're attracted to people, but you need to protect your heart by leaning on people who know you best, who love you most, and will tell you the truth. Because what happens so many times is once we find somebody we like, we cut off the people that love us most, know us best, and will tell us the truth. And we give all our mind, all our attention to the person, and then we lose the ability to discern what is actually going on in our lives. In Genesis 29, it says this. It says, Then Laban said to Jacob, Because you are my kinsman, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me what should be your wages. Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were weak, but Rachel was beautiful in form and appearance. Jacob loved Rachel and said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. And Laban said, it is better that I give, you to her, give her to you than I should give her to anybody else. Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days because of the love he had for her. Rachel trusted her father to help her discern her heart. She was the gatekeeper to keep just any good-looking guy from taking his daughter emotionally away from him. What that means is you need people in your life that can help you see the flaws in the people you're dating because when you're in love, you will not see them. There's a thing called limerence that a lady wrote a book called uh, Limerence in Love way back, I think, in the 60s. She's a psychologist, and limerence is this state of mind that when people fall in love through all this psychological research, that dopamine levels increase. And when dopamine increases, that's what most drugs, when you're on cocaine, dopamine increases. And so what they determined was those first three months to two years of, of dating somebody, you're in love, but you're not just in love, you're high. Like, it's a literal high. That's why you see people who will throw away their relationships for a man that they should not be throwing their relationships away for, just like they were throwing their relationships away for crack cocaine or crystal meth. It's the chemical that is there, and people actually get addicted to the chemical of dopamine, and they'll go from relationship to relationship. Why? Because it increases their dopamine. As a matter of fact, they did research on this, and they found out that for people that have affairs, the affair only lasts three months to 18 months, the exact same time the dopamine lasts from falling in love. And it creates like this halo effect. The halo effect is when there is one positive quality, you think everything's quality or everything's positive about that person. Meaning, for young girls, he's just so cute. He's in prison. Yeah, but he's working on his education. 
No. Or, or you know, she's, she's beautiful, she's this, but she's married. Right? So when there's a halo effect, you're in this dopamine high, and so the high, you'll do anything and everything to protect the high. So when someone tells you, hey, like, this probably isn't a good relationship to be in, you're like, you think they're trying to steal your high. And you'll fight for it just like someone fighting for their drug of choice. And that's why you need people around you to help you fend off the high to make the proper decisions. Young people, let your parents help you. They're not trying to hurt you by saying, hey, this dude probably isn't good for you. They're probably really just telling you, this dude ain't good for you. Ladies, men, you need people in your lives that can hold you accountable and help you filter out bad relationships. But you also need some really good boundaries. Boundaries that protect your heart from going too far too fast. Boundaries that protect you, your purity from giving your purity away to somebody who has no intentions of stewarding it or cherishing it. And protecting your time from investing too much time into a relationship that's never going to pan out anyway. You need people you trust to help you navigate those moments. Number four, though, is don't be a pick-me girl. Date with a purpose, not a need. We hear this word pick-me girl in my house all the time. Pick-me girl is somebody who wants to validate themselves with the attention of the opposite sex. So everything they do, they're trying to get attention. Social media, they're trying to get attention. Uh, in, in life, they're trying to get attention. They're trying to be the highlight or the attention of whatever's going on around them. Why? They need validation from the opposite sex. And when we think about dating, much of our dating processes are nothing more than saying, I'm a pick-me girl. I need somebody to validate me. I don't want to be alone because when I'm alone, I don't feel like I'm good enough. When I'm alone, I don't feel like I'm pretty enough. When I'm alone, I don't feel like I'm worthy enough. When I'm alone, I don't feel valuable enough. When I'm alone, and so you look for people to validate you. And I'm telling you, if you're dating with the need to be validated, your dating is going to fail miserably. Don't date with a need to be affirmed by somebody the opposite sex. Because I'm telling you, they're not there to affirm you. They're there to affirm themselves. So how can they affirm you if they're just trying to fulfill their needs and you get this whole relationship that's tearing you apart? Jefferson Bethke said this, dating with no intent to marry is like going to the grocery store with no money. You either leave unhappy or take something that isn't yours. Like our mantra in our household is dating is qualifying for marriage. Meaning when you're dating, it's, it's the process of seeing if this person is someone I'm willing to give my life to which would tell you, if you wouldn't marry the person, don't date the person. Why would you waste time and energy and life and love and money on somebody there's no end result there possible? I Meaning you start, when you start dating, you start with this person is marriage material. And then from there, you are looking for reasons to disqualify them from being marriage material. Don't look for reasons or excuses to make them marriage material. Look for reasons to say no. But once we get into a relationship, we start trying to find excuses. Well, you know, he's really not that bad. Well, you know, he, he only really cussed me out one time. Okay, he only hit me once. No, that's, more, that's one time too many. You don't look for excuses for people to get married. Like you're literally, you start with this is marriage material, and until we get to he's not, I'm in. But once he hits that mark, we're done. Because dating is this. Everyone starts every relationship with a brick wall up. And we give our best image, our best look, our best speech, our best game, whatever it is. You start with this wall up, and then dating is slowly but surely taking down brick by brick to get to know who's on the other side of that wall. And once they show you who they are, believe them. Once they show you who they truly are, believe them. Because in the same way in those those pies, those physical attraction, if you really want to get to know them, if you want to marry them, you may want to see them without makeup on. Intellectually, if you're going to be attracted to them intellectually, you need to know who they truly are. You may want to find out what their credit score is. 
emotionally. You may want to see how they act when they don't get their way. Actually, emotionally, you may want to see how they respond when you say no. Because how they respond when you say no will tell you pretty much everything you need to know about them. Spiritually, you may want to see if this relationship is pushing me towards Jesus or pulling me away from Jesus. And so when you start answering those questions in dating, it will tell you, do we move forward or do we step back? And most of the time, you'll see real quick, should I move forward or should I move back? And then rule number five is you don't fall in love, you commit to it. So choose wisely. You fall in love temporarily with that limerence. You get, you get high real quick. But at some point, that high calms down. And you can't use, I fell in love as an excuse anymore. You choose who you commit your life to. As a matter of fact, love is not a high. Love is a commitment. And it's a sacrifice. And it's actually this. You choose who you love, and you have to make that choice every single day of your life. Because when the dopamine drops down, you're left with somebody that you're not in a high for anymore. You have to make a commitment to choose, I'm going to love you today like I did yesterday. And it's actually the most expensive decision you ever make. Toy was made this with me last night. When you realize the person you choose to get married with is like starting a partnership financially for life. But it's not just your business, it's all of your life. If you don't think it's expensive, ask Jeff Bezos. If you don't think it's expensive, ask anybody who's given their life to a marriage and then tried to build their marriage and build their career and they get divorced. Literally, you already lost 50%. But not just that, spiritually, who you decide to give your life to or give your heart to will determine if you arrive to your spiritual destination or not. Because Paul is very clear you should not be unequally yoked to non-believers. Because he knows you can't get to where God wants you to go if you're dragging around an anchor who's not going the same way. And so you have to learn how to choose who to give your life to. Because as the church moves forward, and as Pastor Marissa is saying, as Jesus begins preparing his church, your relationship is going to be more vital because the world is now going in the opposite direction of the church. So if you're equally yoked with somebody going this direction, you're going this way, it's going to tear your heart apart, or you're going to give in and go that way. You see with Samson, you see with David in parts of his life, See, with Solomon, Solomon, the greatest king of all, wise beyond his years. And at the end, he loses pretty much everything because of relationships with women. And you'll never find the right person if you keep holding on to the wrong person. Now, this is not one of those old school youth revivals where break up with your boyfriend before you hit the door. Like, it ain't that. But for some of you, you need to be encouraged that you'll never find the right person if you keep holding on to the wrong people. And I want to encourage you that you don't have to stay with somebody just because you've invested a whole lot of time in them. I'm talking about if you're dating, not if you're married. You don't have to stay with them just, well, you know, we've been dating two and a half years. Well, if it ain't going anywhere, it ain't going anywhere. Well, you don't have to stay with somebody just because you messed up sexually with them. Actually, that may be a really good reason not to stay with them. Well, you know, I just, I, 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 I don't know, I don't, I, I'm getting older, I don't know if there's anybody else, I don't, no, 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 no. It doesn't matter what the ticker on your calendar looks like. The wrong person is still the wrong person. And I want to encourage you, run after Jesus. Look to your right, look to your left, and if there's somebody there, introduce yourself. If they're not, run faster because what you're waiting for may be out in front of you. If you would, bow your heads and just close your eyes just for a second. You know, relationships are, are tough regardless of the situation. But it is so tough 
for people who are single in this day and age. There's so many distractions, so much temptation, especially for our young people. There's just so much influence in their lives trying to get them to do life a certain way or specific way. But there is a proper way to get to know people to decide if they're the right person or not. And so I'm just, I'm, I'm praying just for a move of God in our singles and those that are dating, those that are single again, those that are divorced, those that are widowed. Like God still has a purpose for you. But also, I want to pray for those of you, maybe you're in the room and you said, you know what, I haven't been pursuing Jesus. So maybe the relationships you've been in are bad relationships because you're introducing yourself to people that are lukewarm just like you. Or maybe they're unsaved just like you. And today would be a great day. If you, if you really, really want to have God's best in your relationships, it starts with you pursuing Jesus and becoming the person Jesus died for you to be. And so I'd encourage you today to say yes to Jesus. Jesus, I'm going to make this commitment today to pursue you above everything else. I'm going to repent of my past ways and my sin. I'm going to give my heart to you, and I'm going to run after you. I'm not going to have you come forward. I'm not going to have you stand up. It's between you and God. One private moment for the day. If you say, that's me. It's between you and God. I just want you to slip your hand up real quick. Thank you. Anybody else? One quick moment. I'm going to pray, and as I pray, at the end of service, if you just go by the connection point, let them know, hey, I prayed that prayer with pastor. And they'll give you just a gift to say, you know, we want to help you and equip you and empower you to get that direction. Father, we bless you in this place. We thank you for the gospel, which is the good news that there's always hope, even in the middle of hopeless situations. And Father, we thank you for the blood of your son, Jesus, that washes us and cleanses us and renews us and gives us a new hope and a new future in you. So, Father, for all those that raised their hand, even those that didn't, that said, right now my heart is stirred for a fresh start and a new beginning. Father, I pray that you just saturate them with your Holy Spirit. Transform their mind and their hope and their lives to begin running towards the Father's house, running towards their purpose and pursuing your presence. Father, we also pray for all those who are single, those who are dating, those who are single again. Father, those that are teenagers, that, Father, you'll protect their hearts, their minds, and their purity as they go through the obstacle course of relationships. Father, give them wisdom and discernment. Father, help them to not waste the waiting. Father, help them to know who they're looking for. Give them the qualities, the characteristics. Give them a promise to stand upon. Father, also surround them with people that love them the most and know them best and truly have their best interests at heart to help them discern and filter every single relationship. And then, Father, help them to date with a purpose to honor you, to glorify you, and to walk out into a healthy marriage. Father, above all, I just pray that you protect their minds, their hearts, and their spirits and use them for your glory. In Jesus' name.